much short. Let me check again. Yes, it's recording now. Okay, uh, this is the lesson four of our C uh, system programming course, uh, C++. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess one of you, uh, let me check. I guess one of you has its microphone on, his or her microphone on. I don't know who. Let me see. I can hear some noise, but I don't know why. Okay, don't know. All of them are off. Okay. So last time we discussed about um, some exercises, the exercises I gave you and the solutions uh, for them. And then we discuss about uh, the last type of uh, function uh, parameter passing. And the other one was uh, pointers. We discuss about different uh, memory types that we have. And the last thing that we discuss about was function templates. And I also gave you one uh, exercise um, to work with, uh, to exercise more with uh, function templates. So in this lesson, we will first um, uh, discuss about that exercise and then uh, template specialization. Uh, standard, uh, we will discuss about a standard template li library. We do not have enough time to discuss all about all the containers, algorithms, and so on in um, uh, standard template library. But uh, the good thing is that they have uh, very similarity. So if you get familiar with some of the containers, you can easily learn yourself some other containers as well. Uh, this is also the case with algorithms inside standard template library. For example, most of them are working, I, the, most of them needs two uh, pointers to the beginning of the, uh, to, be, uh, to the start of the uh, container and to the end of that. So they are their structure is very similar to each other. And if you learn some of them, you can uh, learn the others as well. So here in this uh, lesson, we will discuss about some of the most uh, common uh, containers and algorithms in a standard template library, then lambda function and smart pointers, which are really, really like a gift um, to you. These are very um good thing that the then if you have a smart pointers you don't need to work with the standard pointers and you are you know how um difficult it is to work with standard pointers you have to be worried about the memory allocation and the rest but with smart pointers you don't have this uh, these problems if we find enough time, then we will discuss about uh, header guards, boost library, not uh, just how to add boost library to your project, then read and write from files and uh, parsing strings, uh, converting data types, uh, working with paths, regular expressions. Uh, I'm not sure we will cover all of these uh, topics in this lesson, but uh, since the previous lesson we had uh, more time, uh, I put more uh, topics in this slides, and if we find enough time, we will cover them. If not, we will discuss about them uh, in the next lesson. In the next lesson, we are going to talk mainly about the classes. Then by the end of that lesson, you will know all the things that you need to know uh, for your first part of your project. So by the end of lesson five, uh, you need all you need for um, that project. Uh, and these topics from header guards and also smart pointers and the rest, uh, usually I gave them uh, in the last lesson of the course, uh, but as I said in the previous lesson, I decided to move them to this uh, time because um, you are going to give us the first part of the, your project now and you are going to work with files. So um, it's better to know them uh, before uh, that. Uh, but if, even we cover these topics in the next lesson, you will still have uh, two or three weeks uh, 
um, more uh, to to, I mean, two more um, two more weeks to work with uh, to implement your project. But I actually heard from one of your colleagues that uh, you, there are some people are, uh, that are already developed their project and even um, with their own knowledge. And uh, so it's very a very good news, very good piece of news. So the, uh, the, the exercise that you had um, was this one, write a program which receives two variables of the same type and checks if they are equal or not. And I ask you consider these two data types. We actually solved this problem in the last lesson using overloading functions, but we know that we can do it um, better. So, and I, at that time, I told you that better, uh, the best solution for that is using template functions. For overloading, we defined two different functions with the same name, but, and also with the same body. But we said that because they have the same body structure, um, it's not really good to use overloading. And we said that we use overloading when the bodies are different from each other, resulting from different parameters. But the functions are doing the same functionality. But the body here was exactly the same. So the solution for that would be using a template function. So how can I write that template function like this? It's exactly like the function that we have here. But instead of the data types, I have this pattern here, template type name T or our placeholder. And instead of that data types, I'm writing that uh, the name of that placeholder here. And the body is exactly the same. When I'm calling R equal, then I have to define the type here. R equals to the string and the for string. Ex again here, I can also call it with integers and with integer values. So with both of these two, I'm instantiating one uh, function from this fun uh, template function. And I don't need to write this function and duplicate our course. And we said that it's not really uh, good. We should not repeat ourselves in our program. Uh, it's uh, this function is kind of not exactly similar to what you are going to implement for your first project. For example, um, here I'm uh, comparing uh, these two uh, strings with the string types. I I'm here converting these two with um, integer type, but I could also write here, for example, string and put these two numbers into two double quotations and make them a string and do the comparison based on the strings. But something that it's really important for you to know is that uh, comparison, uh, you can, if you compare two numbers with each other, it's different from comparing them uh, with their um, corresponding string formats. For example, here, sad, sorry, <laughs> 100 is, equal, is greater than two, and um, but if you compare them in uh, uh, string format, 100 is uh, lesser than two because the uh, ASCII code for one is uh, smaller than, is lesser than uh, the ASCII code for two. So if your user in their um, comments asks you to do the comparison based on the strings for your number, your results should be different from when they ask uh, to do the comparison based on the integer format. So, but the function behind that is just a template and the template is responsible to solve this, um, um, this problem, how to do the comparison for different data types. Let's see uh, how can we do that with template specialization. This is a piece of uh, information that I uh, copied from this uh, um, address. Since it was very clean, I decided just to copy it here and, and I will read it for you. And I think it's uh, much clearer than just explaining what I'm going to say. So template in C++ is a feature 
the right code once and use it for any data type, including user-defined data types. For example, sort can be written and used to sort any data uh, type items. So if you remember in Python, in other languages, you have usually a sort function that can work with any different, therefore many different data types. So in that case, it means that we have a template at the back of uh, implementation of that sort function. Or we have other containers like stack, queue, or so and so on. And all of them can work with different data types. So this means that we have here template. So what if we want to uh, we want a different code for a particular data type? It means that I want to behave differently for just one or two to a uh, um, different data type. But mostly we are, we are doing the same, we have the same body for most of the data types, but for one of them, we are going to have different body, but the, uh, the, the functionality is the same, but the implementation is kind of different. So consider a big project that needs a function sort for arrays of many different data types. Let QSort be used for all the data types except for CAR. In case of CAR, total possible values are 256, and counting sort might be a better option. So if you had a data structure in your courses, we have different ways of sorting, um, um, sorting a list, for example. And uh, Quick sort is one of them, counting sort is the other one. Counting, counting sort is for integers, for a small uh, list of uh, numbers. And it's saying that, okay, let's do the uh, um, uh, sort based on the quick sort for most of the data uh, uh, types, but for cars, we want to have a uh, counting sort. So it means that for the body for car is different from the other data types, but the functionality is the same. So is it possible to use different code only when sort is called for car data type? It is possible in C++ to get a special behavior for a particular data type. This is called template specialization. So let's see one example. Uh, this is a, uh, one example similar what uh, in here we talked about. We have here a sort function. It, the classes, the term class is here is similar to just write type name. So both are doing the same. And uh, I'm defining a sort function and I, uh, the body is not defined here, but just imagine there is a body here, which is based on quick sort. And uh, that uh, this is the input array. The type is T and uh, we have also the size of that array. But for a character, instead of writing, I will have another function. Instead of writing the template here, the template and the placeholder here, this part will be empty. But like when we are calling a template, like when we are calling a template, we write the type of char here. And for every location that we have that placeholder, we write char as well. And then the body of this one can be different from the body of this. Calling this two are similar to each other. So when you are calling func char, func int, func float, you think that you are working with one template function. But in fact, when we are calling func char, it will call the specialization of that simple function. I could just write another function here. Then I to call that fun without a specialization. I should call fun that fun without this. So it would be like overloading a template with another function. But it's not re really good when we have a template. OK, we should stick to that and we should not um, bring other uh, concepts to that when we can have template specializations. 
So let's do this uh, example, this exercise that I asked you to do uh, in the last lesson. Uh, this is a, again, this is not uh, exactly like what you are going to do for your project, so don't confuse them. Uh, but it's very similar to what you are going to do. I'm here. I asked you to do the uh, comparison for a string, also for um, lesser, be greater, and so on. But here, I asked you to imagine I'm going to do only uh, check the equality for strings, but for other data types, I only want to uh, check. Um, um, I want to check greater, lesser, and equality. So I write one template function here. The template function is R equal. It will return a Boolean. So it's still similar to the previous one. And we have two input elements. The type is T, and I'm saying that const reference, so I as I said in the previous lesson, we can work with um, uh, we can work with um, and, and type names, placeholders, exactly like other data types that we have. So we can pass them by const by reference. Uh, then I have a comparison type, which is an enum class that I defined here. It has equal, greater, lesser. It can have some other things, but the example here is like this. The exercise that we define is, is asking for equal, greater, and lesser. But we could have, for example, equal and greater, equal and lesser. These two could also be um, added. So I'm saying, uh, I also have another parameter, which is our error type. And it's it's useful to handle our errors. We can also throw exceptions to handle our errors or return a value like 0, minus 1, 2, and define all of them for our uh, different errors. But I asked you to implement them with an enum class and handle that um, when you are um, calling this function. We will see how we can call them and how can we handle these errors when you are calling uh, this function in the next slide. So if the type is, uh, I'm doing the, uh, the, I'm doing the comparison according to the type of the comparison type, According to the type that I define, I, uh, the user uh, uh, passed when calling uh, this function. And if the error type, uh, if the sorry, if the comparison type is not among these uh, three comparison type, then it will return, it will update error with this error type wrong input data. For your program, you will have error types, more, you will have more um, error types than this one. Here I only had two error types, but you can have more than that, like division by zero, like, okay, so you don't have, I think, division by zero, but empty strings, for example, or uh, wrong comments, for example, um, wrong data types, the data types that you don't support, um, or Something like this, you, you can define some error types like this and you will um, handle it. Um, you will show a message based on that error type to your user um, in the uh, console. So here I have a specialization of that template for a string because I only want to do the comparison for equality. So I, in my case, only have one equal uh, item, and for the others, because we have, sorry, for others, I only, uh, I will uh, update error with wrong input data. I'm saying that for, I don't have any results for other data, uh, other comparison types. So I wrote nothing here, 
I wrote this sun string here and for any other time, any other places that I had that uh, template and uh, that placeholder, I wrote steady string. I define the function here, which is get message to convert that error type to a message that is clear to the user. So it's not really good to show that uh, value for your uh, enum class to your user. You should interact well with, with your user. You should sh show a clear message to that. And you should not show much about uh, your implementation to your user. So they should only see some messages that are um, clear to them. So I, for example, for no error, I'm returning success. For wrong input data, I'm returning, OK, wrong input data, but not, not like this. And for default, I'm saying that error type is undefined. So we don't have it. Uh, here, um, when in our main function, when I'm going to call this R equal, I, ha I have to check if there is an error or not. So first, I define an error type, and I set it to no error. I call error equal, I'm uh, sorry, R equal for a string. It will call our template specialization. With these two elements, I do the comparison type. I'm asking that check if they are equal or not. And error. When I'm going to use R equal, this um, variable, the uh, output of this function, I should first check if there is an error or not. If there is no error, I will show the results to the user. If not, I will use that get message to convert that error to a message and then show that message to our user. So, for example, here there is no uh, error because it's equality, it will show the results. But here I'm calling this function with greater and since there is an error, it will say it's wrong input data. It will go to this function and it will show a message to the user, which is wrong input data. You can change it to other uh, messages. So for example, you can tell the user that, okay, it's for strings, we don't support greater. Wrong input data for a string function or some other things. You can communicate better than this. It's just one example. Uh, for R equal, uh, I mean for integer, I'm using lesser and it will show me the results because it's calling that template, not that specialization. For all of these things, for your program, for the first part of your project, all of them will be in your console project. So because you only have one project. But, but for the second, for your final project, I'm going to ask you to put all these things inside the dynamic link library. But the main function will still remain in the main, in your console. For your final project, you will have a GUI and a dynamic link library. Here you only have one console application, so you don't need to be worried about uh, these things that I wrote here. Everything is in your console application, but your, for, for your final projects, these things, all of these things should be in your dynamic link library and, and uh, communicating with your user, showing the results, showing the error messages should be done in your GUI. But this is not the case for your first project. OK, do you have any question? Did you get, get uh, templates and template specializations? No question? OK, if you have any question, you can ask. Because we are moving to another topic. OK, um, the other topic that we are going to discuss, and which is 
it's very it's very important for you to know it's a standard uh, library it's very useful i mean it's uh, uh, it's equally important and equally uh, uh, useful so i think this is something that um also, it might be kind of difficult to work with for the a start for the when you start to work with that one. These are give you uh, more features than the standard data types, the standard algorithms, but it gives you much more features. So it you can it can make implementing your program uh, much easier than uh, what you can do with only a standard uh, data types. So a standard template uh, library is a collection of classes that provide template, uh, templated uh, containers, algorithms, and iterators. So as the name says, it's a, uh, it's a template-based library. So it offers you, it provides you uh, with some uh, containers which can work with any data types, and um, some algorithm that also can work with any data types, but they are doing the same functionality. So it means that the the um, the way that they are implemented is based on some templates. So some template functions or template classes. I didn't teach you what uh, template classes are because you do you are not uh, familiar with classes yet, but they are very similar to. Uh, functions. The concept is the same. For function templates, you have some functions that can work with any data types, and uh, for classes, you have some functions. You have some classes that can work with different data types. Uh, for when you are working with containers in an algorithm in uh, a standard template library, you don't need to be worried about templates implementation and so on. But you need to know that how they implement it. You need to know that uh, this library, why we call this library a standard template library. We have sequence containers like vector, like vector, spring, deck, a list, array, and so forth. We have associative containers, map, set, uh, and so forth. Uh, container adapters like stack and queue, uh, unordered associative containers, on like an unordered map, unordered set, and so on. We have algorithms like find, find if, max elements for each, copy, replace, remove it sort, uh, else elements, binary search. There are many, many different uh, algorithms. Uh, to see the whole, uh, the list of all of them, you can go to this address for containers and to this address for algorithms. Uh, we won't be able to cover all of them, but as I said in the beginning of the class, uh, beginning of the lesson, uh, they are very similar. If you learn to work with, for example, with vectors, then you will also learn how to do the strings. Of course, they have, will have different algorithms, different functions, uh, but um, you only need to search for them and uh, learn them. But uh, so it's not really uh, difficult. If you get uh, familiar with one of them, then you can also uh, work with some of them, then you can also work with uh, the others. And um, I think this was the only thing that I wanted to say here. OK, so we will discuss about some uh, common um, uh, containers and algorithms here in this lesson. The first one and the most common one is vector. A vector class is a dynamic uh, array capable of growing as needed to contain its elements. So. If you remember in one of the exercises that we had, we, ha we defined one array and I told you, okay, for the moment, you will work this standard arrays, but they are not the best options that you can have in C++. They are like more C style of uh, coding, not a C++ style of co coding. Uh, the lengths of that arrays are um, uh, static. You cannot, um, they cannot grow. 
But with vectors, this is not the case. With vectors, they can grow as needed while uh, you are adding any number to them, they will grow. How can we define a vector? We can define a vector of integer like this, vector, int, and vect. And as you can see, I always write steady behind that, and I don't use using namespace. I'm uh, using uh, namespace std because as you remember in the first lesson, I told you that this is not a good habit. At least, I mean, for large um, uh, scopes, it's not really good to use uh, using namespace, but in a small scope of um, programming, C++, but it's okay, you can use using namespace. Uh, so, here I define a vector of integer, but I could define a vector of float, a vector of any class that you, uh, your a user defined class that you, a class that you will define, a vector of vector, a vector of other containers. Why I can do this? Because they are template based classes, so they can support other data types. So I uh, define here vector of ints. To add some elements to this vector, I use pushback, but there are other ways. This is just one way of doing that. Um, so I'm using a four. I'm adding uh, elements of uh, these uh, uh, four to this uh, vector. Every item will be added to the end of that vector. And I, defi uh, I define another four to uh, to modify the elements of that vector. I can just access to that and modify that by this. And I can visualize them by this one by index. I can access to by indexing. I can access uh, uh, the elements of uh, our vector. And as you can see here, I here I use auto when I defined my four, but here I wrote steady size t. But why? Because I'm checking here the condition for my loop is to check if it is lesser than the size of the vector. The size of the vector is not an integer. The size of the vector is a steady size t, which is a um, um, it, which is a data type in our standard uh, template library. So if you write, for example, here auto or int, the type of i would be int because it's assigned to zero. And here the comparison would be um, would be between integer and std size t. And since they have two different data types, you will get a warning. And as you know, we should not have any warning. We should fix all of our warnings. To fix that warning, we have to define i as steady size t. So this is the case usually for most of the for loops that in, in that you will compare uh, the iterator with uh, the size of your um, container. But maybe in the recent compiler, what I'm saying is for uh, the compiler C++14, maybe this is uh, solved in a uh, uh, newer version of C++ compiler and you don't have this warning anymore. But um, till uh, the end of, I mean, till um, C++14, we had this problem and to solve this, we had to do this. Uh, this is one way of indexing. With this way, I can index, uh, I can access one element of our vector, like how we can access um, our arrays. But there are, there is another way, which is vect, uh, which is at, at with parentheses. But what is the difference between these two? It's not good to use this one and uh, everywhere so it's it has some cases you should not use it, use it everywhere because it ha has to check something it has it's doing an extra thing uh, compared to uh, this way of indexing and what is that extra thing if i here use vect uh, 12 with these um, braces these rectangular braces 
we will have a session failure because 12 is not uh, lesser than the size of the vector. But if I write here dots at and 12, at will check if 12 is lesser than size, then it will return that element. If not, it will throw an exception and I can catch that exception here using try catch. So, and the type of the exception that it will return is out of range. I'm here catching that one if it, if it returns this one. If I write, for example, here 10, there is no exception and I will not go to here. But if I write 12, an exception will happen. And with uh, this try catch, I can catch it. I will have that error, that exception inside this variable. It is a reference to that. So we will not have a copy of that. And with error dot what, I can show the message of that uh, to my user. So the output for this one would be error colon and invalid vector subscript. But for example, you have here, you are working, you have a four, and you are already checking if I is lesser than size. So here it's not really good to use that uh, at I because you are just adding one extra checking to your program why it's not needed, it's, I mean, the check is useless because you cannot, there, there, it will never be uh, greater, I will not, not never be, um, will never be uh, greater than the size. So for such cases, you should not use at. But if you are getting something from your user and uh, if you don't want to check it yourself, you can call at and then use try catch to get get it here you could i mean it was not necessary to um have error here you could just write this one and not to use uh, error and then not to use what but since i wanted to use to show also the message of the error to the user i had to put error here it define a variable i could here instead of this write three dots we in uh, Python, we call it LFCS, um, to catch all the exception that may happen here. So if you write some piece of code, some functions, some other things, any different types of um, uh, exceptions can be catched using three, uh, uh, three dots. But it's not really good to use that because you should be aware of the type of the exception that is happening to your program and handle it accordingly. That's why we don't use uh, dot, uh, three dots here. You can also throw an exception yourself. So you can here write, for example, throw steady out of range parentheses, and inside that parentheses, you can write a message. And when you are using error dot what, when you catch that exception, that message will be shown to the user. But I don't um, want you to implement such a thing because handling exception are kind of dangerous. If you don't catch it, catch them, your program will crash. So, and it's not also clean, and it will it can uh, change the control of your program. Uh, it's not like for if you remember, I told you with uh, for with return we can return to the a function that is calling our function. With uh, break and continue, with break we can uh, go out of our for loop, but it will, we will still remain in the same control flow. But uh, with, ex uh, with throwing an exception, it's not like that. When you throw an exception, it will um, go to the place that you catch that one. So. You may call many nested functions and it will not, if you throw an exception, it will go to the go to the location that you catch that exception. 
So it's it's a like a big it can be a like a big jump, and it's kind of dangerous. So it's better to use um, um, in on classes and handle them like that. And when you are working with that, then you check if there is an error or not. But you should know what what are exception, what uh, how to handle the exceptions because. Like a, st a standard template library, there are also other templates, uh, other libraries that they handle the error by uh, throwing exceptions. So when there is an error, they throw an exception. So if you are working with a, a function, with a method uh, from a library, you should go to the documentation, check what are the type of um, exception that they can throw. And when you are using those functions, you should catch those exception, otherwise your program may, may crash. OK, let's come back to our uh, container, uh, vector container. It's uh, here I'm saying that I said that the length of our vector can grow, so we don't need to define any size for our vector. But we can initialize it with a sum, uh, with a number, that it's uh, reserving some location of memory for my vector. So if I write here 10, it will reserve 10 locations of memory of type int for my vector. And as long as it stays, I add, for example, only 10, 10 or less than 10 elements to that, it will work with that location of memory and it doesn't need to uh, think about uh, other um, to get more um, memory uh, from our stack memory. For example, here it can also work with uh, heap memory. Uh, but if you add more data, it will grow. So it's really uh, good habit. If you know how many elements you want to have in your vector, you initialize that with that number. But it doesn't mean that it will be like this till the end of your program. It can grow, even if you initialize it with some number. Uh, for example, here I um, set it to 10. Uh, I initialize it with 10 different um, size. I mean, its size is 10, but uh, with uh, zero elements because int will be initialized by zero. But again, I can initialize it like this with um, 11 uh, different items. And even if it's 10, it's with 11 by growing the, the, its size. Again, after that, I can push back some elements to that. And it's well, by doing that, I'm the number would be, we will have 31 different items because we had here 11. We are adding all, uh, push backing some 20 more elements. So we will have th uh, three, 31 um, elements. There is another way also to uh, add elements to my uh, vector, which is IOTA. It asks for the start of your vector and the pointer to the end of your vector. And it says that you should uh, add one element, uh, add uh, um, sequentially some elements to this uh, vector from zero uh, till the end of that, uh, and uh, so it would be for our case, it would be from zero till 31 because the length of that uh, um, our vector is 31, so it would be zero till uh, 30, uh, yeah, zero till 30. So if you want to know, this is, um, I mean, more um, theoretically, it, this one is defined in numeric. Uh, header file. So it means that if you are going to this function, you should include numeric. And if you are uh, working with vector, you should include vector. Uh, fills the range from first till uh, last with sequentially increasing values, starting with values and repetitively evaluating um, uh, incrementing uh, value. So it will overwrite your um, vector with these elements. We have two different way of, ways of, common ways of uh, working with our um, containers. One way is this one. 
It's like for each. I'm saying that for every item of this vector, uh, iterate and show that to the user. And I'm saying that don't copy item from the vector. Just give me a reference to item. And the type of that would be the type of the items from our vector. This is very useful. We, are, we don't have any copy, but, the, uh, but this means that since we have a reference to item, if I change item here to any element, the elements of the vector will also change. If I put const here, const auto and um, ampersand, then it means that we, we, we do not have any copy, but we, we cannot change it because it's a const. It's a const variable. And uh, the other way is to work with the smart pointers. If I get vect.begin, it will give me a smart pointers referring to, that, uh, to the start of that vector. And I'm saying that as long as we haven't reached to the end of uh, our um, uh, to the end of our uh, vector, um, it uh, uh, increments my uh, pointer by one. And smart pointers are exactly similar, I'm not exactly, are very similar um, to a standard pointer. So to work with them, you have also the uh, uh, indir indic indir sorry, indication operator. So it means that by doing this, I'm changing the data that uh, ITR is referring to. So I'm, I'm changing the item inside the vector that ITR is referring to by one. I'm incrementing that by one. And I can show the data inside that with indication operator like this. So this, you are already familiar with indication operator when we discuss about uh, pointers. But this now, this is not a standard pointer. If you write this piece of code in your program and check it, you will see that this is just a smart pointer. Uh, so till here is vector. Is it, is it clear? If you have any question, you can ask. If not, we can go to uh, uh, map the other container. No question? Okay. I hope you're listening. <laughs> okay. So, map. Another container that is very useful and very common to use, to be used, uh, is map. But this one is different. So vector was very similar to arrays. It could have any data type and it could grow. In map, we have a set of, every element is a set of key and value. It's similar to dictionaries that you have in uh, Python, for example. But they, in Python, the dictionaries are not sorted. But here, the ma uh, maps are sorted based on their keys. We have also an ordered map that we cannot discuss in our course about that, but you can learn about that yourself. But that one is exactly similar to uh, dictionaries that you have in Python. So, Map is different from that, and what is it? Uh, we have a map of string and int. This one is the type of our keys, and int is the type of our values. How can we add one element to my map? Just like this one, I can say name age. I want one element with this key, which is Tom, and the value is 20. I can also write another one. I want to have one element which whose keys is Mina and the uh, the value is 
40. If I write it again with another value, it will substitute, it will replace 40 with 60 because key are unique in our map. It will not throw any exception, it will not have any problem, but it means that you want to replace that value with the new value. Exactly similar what we had in uh, for vectors, we can have similar uh, uh, a for loop, like a for each, for our for the elements of our map. But we know that elements of our map are a pair of two other elements, a key and a value. So item would be a pair of string and int. And pair is exactly a data type in a standard template library. How can I access these key and values from our um, uh, 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 from uh, this item with first and second? These are two attributes from pair which let which gives us the first elements of that pair and second elements of that. And the first element is the key and the second element is the value. So with, uh, with this iterator, I can see all of them and there is no copy here. But if I change that, since it's a reference to that, the items in our map will change as well. Uh, I can define just one pair like this, and to define uh, to, to I define this variable, but to set some value to that, I can instantiate from that from that pair using make pair with two elements. If you start working with a standard template library, you will see there are some functions like this one: make pair, make shared and so on, that you can create one instance of your container and assign it to a variable of that type. So with pay, we also have such a function. We, with this one, we have an instance of this pair, this pair, and I assign this variable to this, uh, uh, to this value. We, as I said, this is standard template library is template based based so it doesn't have to only work vector for example it doesn't have to be only vector of int vector of float as i said it can have other containers now i have vector of pairs so it's not ordered every time it's the uh, the pairs are not unique i mean we can have multiple of these pairs. And it's, I mean, it's kind of similar to map, but it's different. Here, the keys are unique, uh, and also they are sorted, but here in vector, they are not sorted and they are not unique. So we have a vector of pair here to push, to add item to this one, then I cannot add it like this, I have to, push back a pair to that, and to create that pair, I use make pair. But the for loop is again similar to this one, as you can see, because every, we are looping over this vector of pair, and when I loop over that, every element of that is a pair, and to access to first element we have this attribute and the second element we have this attribute so the structure you can see is similar because this one is vector of pair map is also every element of that is a pair a combination of containers can be used since STL is a template based library and here, this is a question. I usually ask the students to do it at uh, in the class, but um, since we are not um, giving the course in, in person, it's difficult to handle this. But I ask you to do this at home. 
uh, check how to add and edit items. Define a variable like this. It has a, it's a map. The keys of the map is a string. The value is a vector of int. This is a standard template library, so it means that it can have any data types, any containers. The containers are just some data types. The classes are just some data types. Standard data types, int, float, and so on. So all of these things um, can be an elements of our uh, container. But define such a thing, try to add some elements to that, try to show those elements. Uh, try how to, can you access the elements of this one, this vector using this map uh, at home. And if you had any question, feel free to ask. So if you don't have any question about uh, map, then we can go to some algorithms. No? Okay. So, as I said, we just, I mean, until here we got familiar with some uh, uh, some containers, but uh, we can also we also have some algorithms. So I asked you to get familiar with other uh, containers. Just when you are uh, trying to have a structure. Uh, think with yourself that okay can i have it with a container is it common with all the um, programmer that they need such a structure for example you need to implement a queue or you need to implement a stack then think with yourself this is something that probably is very common with all the people so it means that there is a structure uh, like this implemented in a standard template library and go for that one and use that one because those are implemented uh, um, very professionally and they are optimized. And probably they, um, I mean, when you have something optimized, why well, you should implement it yourself. And if, if there is no uh, difference between what is implemented already with yours. Uh, this is also the case with uh, um, algorithms. So, for example, when you have, you think that you need, you have a sorted list, you want binary search. Uh, so you know that this is the case with all the programs. Many uh, people has uh, such a scenario. So there is an uh, algorithm like this implemented in a standard template library, uh, whose name is BST. So then you will use that one. So. Here I'm giving you some um, information about the uh, common algorithms in a standard template library. The first one is find. I defined here a vector of integers. I push back some elements to that. And here I'm checking if five is among the items of this vector. Uh, when I do this, um, to do this one, I need to use a function uh, whose name is find from our standard template library. This function needs a pointer to the start and end of that vector and a value that is checking, that is trying to find inside that vector. If it doesn't find this, it will return a pointer to the end of that vector. If not, if it finds that uh, mm, item, it will return a pointer to that item. So here I can use either. I mean, I I didn't use I didn't save that uh, pointer here. I could assign here uh, a steady find to an iter, which is a pointer to um, elements of this vector and show that value here or modify it here with indication operator. But they just show the message. But I can have, uh, this is a, uh, a function that I can use for a vector. But map has a method 
functions are different from methods. Functions are functions defined in a library that are working on a container or on a data type. But methods are some functions defined for a class and they are working for that class. So find here is a method which is defined for map function and only works with that one. And I can access a method or attributes of that class with dot. So here I'm calling this method from this map class and I'm searching for this one, which is a key of our, um, uh, our map. If it doesn't find it, it will return an iterator to the end of that map. If not, it will return an iterator to that uh, element. But I again didn't uh, save it to, uh, I could save it to an uh, iterator and work with that, but I didn't because I, if it exists, then I can access with this uh, indexing uh, way of accessing my values in <coughs> map. <coughs> Sorry. So these are two different uh, functions. They are very similar. Um, you see they are both, if they are not successful, they will return an iterator uh, to the end of uh, that uh, container. Uh, they are very similar, so you can also find similar function for other con uh, containers like unordered maps and so on, stack queue uh, and uh, some other containers. We have also copy and copy F. It will copy the elements from one container to another container. For example, here I have vector of integer from vector. I said that it should, its size is 10, but it can be more than that as well. It will reserve 10 location of memories for me. With IOTA, I'm saying that write, uh, set the initialize the elements of uh, this vector from zero till nine, because the size is 10. Uh, for two vector, uh, I'm saying that I want to copy the elements of from vector to two vector. But how I'm doing this? Uh, I'm using a function named steady copy. I give this function the start of the vector, the pointer to the start of this vector, a pointer to the end of this vector, I mean the from vector, and a back inserter, which gives me the end of two vector in every run of this copy. Because this copy has to do this task 10 times to add, to copy every element to from vector. Sorry, from, uh, from, from vector to two vector. And every time the end of two vector is changing. So if I only give two vector dot end here, it would be end of this vector and it will copy it to the, I mean, it would be a st uh, static and it would uh, remain there. But you, we know that with copy, we are changing, we are adding some elements and our end is changing. This method, from a standard template library will gives us every, every time the end of that, this vector while the end of the vector is changing by this process. So again, you will see such a structure, begin and end like find that we have for vectors. We have begin and end and something here. So the structure, as you can see, is kind of similar. To clear the elements of a vector, we have an, a method whose name is clear. But why I'm using shrink to fit here? With clear, the elements will be deleted, but the memory still will be reserved for from vector. So it means that, uh, for example, you have a, a big list of 
uh, in data. You have a big list of data from your even from your heap memory. So you are getting much memory for your program. You want to release it. Okay, you will clear that. And if you clear that, you will release it. But the problem is that it will, I, we noticed that a standard template library may reserve those um, allocation of memories for you. So in that case, you should call shrink to fit to be sure that that location will be released because you may need that. You may need to use that. It will reserve it because it thinks that you will probably use it in uh, the uh, future while you are running your program, but you are aware of that. You know that you don't want to use it or you want to use that location of memories for other variables. Then you have to call shrink to fit. Here I just uh, copied the elements of this one to copy without any condition. So I copied all of them, but sometimes you want to copy only some of them. OK, in that case, you can use copy if with some lambda functions. If you are familiar with uh, um, the lambda functions in Python, they are similar to those, but these uh, lambda functions are more uh, powerful than the lambda functions in Python. Here you have copy if, again, the start of that, the end of the vector, back inserter, one other thing here, which is a lambda function. Again, if you are familiar with Python, in Python you have some functions and they, those functions like filter, like sort, like mean, and they have one elements, uh, one uh, um, arguments, uh, one parameter whose name is key. And for that key, you can define a function and that function will apply to the every elements of that uh, list uh, to, and then the process will be done to those uh, uh, new values. This is also similar to that one. Here I'm saying that, do the copy if the output of this uh, function is true for that item. So it's the input of this function, lambda functions are just anonymous um, function that doesn't have any name, but they are used, sorry, they are used usually inside other functions or um, for defining some threads, for uh, doing some functions like this. And uh, you cannot call it from outside because they don't have any name, but you can write it just for this piece of your program and it will be used here. So this is just defined for this piece of program, this part of your program. Uh, the input is of type integer because the input of this function is the input of this uh, is the elements of this uh, vector. Again, I wrote const reference. It means that I don't want to have a copy of the elements of this vector to my function. Every time give me a const reference of that uh, item of this vector. Uh, and inside that, I'm dividing, I'm checking the remainder of that item to two. And if it is even, I return true. If not, I return false. So it means that it will copy only the, I, the even numbers from, uh, from vectors to two, uh, to two vector. And to show the items, we can just uh, do this one. And again, I can use const reference, and it means that I don't want to change the item in the body of the for loop. Uh, look at this one here. This is a location that I can pass 
the variables that I define before this copy F that exist in this uh, scope, the scope containing copy F, but before this. If I want to pass these variables to, to this function, I need to pass them via this. But here I didn't pass anything. So it means that I do not have access to any vector that is defined here. I only have access to the item of this from vector, just this, because I didn't pass anything except this item. But imagine we are going to compute the number of item, the number of um, um, uh, odd items, the number of odd items in the from vector while we are copying the data. To do so, we define a variable here. And I have to pass CNT here. Since I haven't passed that, you see here, I can see CNT, even if it is defined before copy F, on scope and I it cannot see CNT. What happened? Okay, there is a problem apparently. Why? Okay, we lost the <laughs> data. Our slides. Okay. Does it solve answer? Yes, apparently. What happened? Let's see if I can download it. Okay, the problem that solves. So uh, I was saying that since here I'm going to get the uh, number of uh, odd items that we uh, encounter while we uh, are copying the items from from vector to to vector. Uh, but since here uh, my lambda function has its own scope, I don't have access to uh, CNT and I didn't pass it here. So the way that I can pass it is, for example, here I have two different variables. Uh, is uh, And I want to, the coef is the um, 
the thing that we are going to divide item by that. And uh, I put it again too. And CNT is something that we are going to change. So for QF, I don't want, this is a coefficient that I don't want to change it inside my uh, lambda function, but CNT is something that I'm going to change. So for QF, I just send it like this. It will just send a copy of QF to my lambda function. But if I write ampersand before CNT, it will send a reference of CNT to this function and I can now change CNT. So by doing these two things, I can access to QF and CNT and by doing this, I can change also CNT inside the Lambda function. You don't have such an abilities in uh, Python, but these are uh, really useful things that you can have in um, uh, uh, in um, C++. Plus. Also there you do not have uh, um, copy ifs or something like this. So uh, the other way is that to just write ampersand here. By doing that, it will you will have access to QF and CNT, both of them. You will have to access to all the variables that are defined in this scope before copy if. But and you can also change them. So, but it's dangerous. You you should not do this, and you should not give access to all of the things that you have to your lambda function. Only the things that you need uh, should be passed here. You can also write equals a sign here, and if you do that, it will send a copy of all the variables that you have here to this function. And by doing so, uh, mm, you will have a copy of them. You cannot change them, but you have access to them. And it's not, again, good. Imagine you have a vector of uh, something here, a big data, and you are just doing a small um, um, find it, for example, function or copy a function. By writing this here, you will copy all of them again in your uh, Lambda function, and it's not really recommended. Uh, we saw here copy if we can also have we have also find if and then for find if we also ha can have some conditions here and uh, for example you can for find if uh, you are doing a find if for a class you have for example a vector of some classes and uh, a vector of a class and uh, so that vector has some, some uh, instance of some uh, classes. And uh, okay, let's give, give uh, let me give you a better example. You have a vector of a strings, and you want to find a string uh, from. Uh, you want to find the strings um, uh, whose second character is B, for example. Uh, then you can use find if or uh, your vector of a strings and define a lambda function for your uh, find if in which you will check uh, the second uh, character of your items. If it is a B, you will return true. If it is not, you will return false. So th this is the way that you can work with your uh, uh, find if methods. Uh, it, it's, it's a really useful ability. So we have here some exercises. I give these exercises. You will have some uh, also the answers in these uh, slides when I upload them for you. Um, but I really uh, recommend you to implement them by yourself. I will not discuss about their solutions in this lesson. We will discuss about that in the next lesson. Uh, but it's really important to exercise yourself, to work with them yourself. In this case, you can master it. Otherwise, if you just listen to me, you will not uh, learn it much. Uh, in the previous year, we did all of these examples during the lesson in the class. Uh, but again, it's really difficult to, to handle this um, by the courses uh, online. But they are not really difficult. I'm giving you the answers for them. And you, you just need to spend at, at most one hour to uh, work with these uh, exercises. So the exercises are saying that define a variable to store people's ages. Initialize this variable by 10 different ages. 
ranging from 1 to 10, then transform all the ages by adding them by with 1. So you should define a container and then you should use a for loop to uh, probably here IOTA and then for loop to modify them. Uh, define a dictionary for ID and names of people. Define a function taking this dictionary and an ID and printing the name of the person with that ID. So you define a function, you define a dictionary, and I think that dictionary uh, would be a map. But you should work it, uh, define it yourself, work with that more, try to work with other uh, methods like in place back, um, like back. These are the, the, uh, the other uh, methods from uh, uh, vector uh, that you can work with. Um, try to work with find if and uh, some other uh, method, useful methods. Uh, define a variable to store students' information. A students have a name and list of the scores. This is similar to the first exercise that I gave you to in this lesson. Uh, define a function taking this information and a score index to print the score of the students for the given index. So as you can see, you have the answers also here. But don't look at them before implementing them. First, try your best to implement them yourself, and then uh, you can look at the, uh, um, the answers, the solutions. Uh, we will also discuss about the solution in the next lessons, uh, but you can also read it yourself. Uh, if you have any question, you can ask. Otherwise, we will go to uh, Smart Pointers. No question? Okay. I think I should uh, have added some uh, question for you, like the previous lessons. Then we will have more interaction. <laughs> At least uh, what, with those questions, I will be noticed that uh, I will notice that uh, you got the core uh, the lesson. Uh, for the next lesson, I will add them. So, uh, smart pointers. Uh, okay, this is a good question. I can ask you to make sure <laughs> if you get it or not. Uh, look at this exam example. These are the things that you are familiar with. Let me... Oh. It's became very <laughs> small. OK. Let me just look at this. Oh. OK, look at this. Uh, you don't need this part. Look at this uh, example and tell me what is the problem. These are the things that mostly related to uh, your previous lessons and human is just one class, but the problem is not related to human. Just imagine this is just int, for example. You are defining a pointer of type int. Actually, the answer is written there, but, <laughs> but it's okay. I think when x is equal to zero, the uh, function will return and will not delete the pointer? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but how about the the other one? X1. Uh, 
I think you're throwing an exception, but you're not catching it, so your program will crash. Yes, exactly. And uh, maybe I, I, I'm catching that in another function that I'm calling some function. OK, so it's not a problem like this. But the main problem is that when you are um, throwing an exception here, then it will not run this part of the code. So it will throw an exception. You will catch it somewhere else. But there you cannot delete that pointer. OK, because you do not have PTR anymore. PTR is defined in this function. It is local to this function. It's just a pointer. But the memory that is getting is not from a stack memory. It's getting from heap memory. OK, and since it's getting the memory from heap memory, that memory will stay till my program ends. And I'm creating a link every time that I'm calling this some function, if these two happens and I'm uh, getting some memory from heap memory and creating a leak memory here. But you may think that, OK, this is just uh, it's easy. We can write delete PTR before return here and also before here. But this is just a small piece of code, but it can be larger than this, much larger than this. And then the problem can happen. But how can we solve this problem? Let's see. So with the standard pointers, we are always worried about uh, our memory. We have to delete, since we have to delete them ourselves, we should be really careful when we are returning, when we are uh, destroying a, uh, mm, sorry, when we are destroying a, uh, function, we, uh, these are really, or when you are uh, ex uh, throwing exception, uh, we should be careful that we deleted all the pointers before uh, changing as control flow, ch changing the control, changing the flow of your uh, program, our program. But if we use smart pointers, we don't need to be worried about these things. A smart pointer, a smart pointer is a class that is designed to manage dyna dynamically allocated memory. What does it mean? The memory that is taken from heap memory, and ensure that uh, ensures that memory um, ensures that memory gets deleted when the smart pointer object goes out of the scope. We have two common smart pointers. Sorry, I have to uh, reply here and I will come back. This is the way that we think.
Sorry, <laughs> this is the way that we teach uh, from home. Okay, we can continue. Okay, I was saying that uh, we have uh, smart pointers that can help us with uh, to manage our uh, dynamically allocated uh, memory. We have two different types that are very common. The first one is uh, unique PTR, which is used to manage any dynamically allocated object that is not shared by multiple objects. And uh, the other one is shared PTR, that which is used to solve uh, uh, used to solve the case where you need multiple smart points co-owning a, a resource. Uh, so it means that you, for unique PTR, you only have one pointer to a um, shared object to a to an object. You cannot have multiple. Uh, you cannot share that pointer with multiple objects. But for with shared PTR, it's not like that. We have uh, point multiple pointers. We can share it with different uh, uh, objects. And as long as, as soon as um, the last shared PTR managing the resource goes out of the scope or is reassigned to a pointer referring to uh, something else, the resource will be deallocated. Okay, so then we don't need to delete anything. It will, uh, in their disk uh, uh, destructor, they will delete that, they will release that memory themselves. So as like, here, if we had a smart pointers, since PTR was a smart pointer, not a standard pointer, if it goes outside of this scope, in their they will be destructed. Okay, you will get familiar with uh, classes and destructor and constructors later on in the next lesson. But imagine when we go out of an scope for a class, the destructor will be called. A smart pointer is also a class. It has a destructor. So when it goes out of the class, out of this scope, it will be deleted. So when it's getting deleted, the destructor of that will be called. And that inside that destructor, they will release the location of memory that, we, that they were referring to. Uh, but for shared PTR, only the last um, pointer that referring to that location of memory uh, when or when uh, that one is getting uh, uh, deleted then the memory will be released but for unique PTR we only have one so how can we define a, um, a smart pointer here human is just a class instead of writing this we write this one we create new, so it's similar to here. We create new an instance of that class, class, and unique PTR of that type of that class. And I'm say, defining a pointer with that one. So by new, I'm getting memory location of type human with these values from heap memory. And I'm with, uh, creating a, point, a standard pointer, a unique pointer, referring to that location of memory. And with my pointer is referring to that um, location of memory. You are not familiar with classes. Just imagine instead of human, we have int here. So it's the different for now. I mean, it's not really important. I mean, they are the same. But if I define another unique PTR and try to um, assign this, the first one to the second one, then we will see that we will have an, a build error. So it's not possible for unique PTR. We can only assign, we can only have one pointer to that. We have an object here. We have an object of type unique PTR and we can assign uh, we can refer to that object of type unique PTR only with one unique PTR, not more than. Here I'm similar to this one, I'm, but I'm creating an object of type shared PTR. And with this one, now I can have another pointer of type shared PTR referring to this object of um, type shared PTR. 
But when this one is go out, since both of them are destructed, then this memory will be deleted. We don't need to delete them here. Also this one, when we are going out of this one, we do not have this pointer. It's getting deleted, so the memory will be released. So this is the benefit that we have with the smart pointers. Is it clear? Yes? OK. So let's talk about some of the things that we have. I think we will not be uh, able to cover all of them, but some of them. We already saw some header guys when I, uh, in the previous lesson, I think, when I, I gave you an example of uh, how to work with headers, we saw that when we add a new, uh, when we add a new uh, header files in our uh, Visual Studio, we, we saw that it will add one line of code, which was um, uh, hashtag, I don't know, uh, uh, that sign with uh, Pragma Vines. And uh, I, there I explain a bit for you what, what, it, what it is, but let's uh, explain it more with more uh, with a better example. We know that we cannot have duplicate uh, definition in our program. We cannot, for example, define int x, again int x. In Python, you can do that. But in uh, C++, you cannot do this. You cannot even write, for example, int x, string x. We ca you cannot do that. But in Python, you can. Uh, so this is the problem that we call it duplication definition problem in C++. Uh, but OK, no one will do this one. I mean, it's OK. No one will do this. But this problem can show itself somewhere else. You define a header file with one function inside that. This is the function. You define another header file, and inside that, you will include this uh, header file. What does it mean? It means that this function will be copied here. The definition of this function will be copied here. In your main.cpp, you include this one, uh, geometry.h, and also square.h. This means that you will have two copies of this function in main.cpp. So it means that you have duplicate definition problem. How can we solve this? We should know because this can happen because we, if we, we, we know that the one uh, Method of an header file can be called several uh, in several places. You should be careful not to call it duplicately, but if you do not have uh, any other choice, then you should solve it like this. So the solution is that write the definition in source file. First of all, the definition should be in .cpp file, but it can again, even if you write it in your .cpp file, you may have some problem like this. Uh, Use header guards. What are header guards? The first way is this, and the second way is pragma ones that you are already familiar with. Familiar with. In uh, the first one, which is the um, a standard way, and you can see this way of uh, header guarding in uh, um, Qt library. Uh, there we have. Um, we, we define some macros like this. We are saying that if some unique name, just a unique name that you define for your header file, it can be the header, the name of this header file. And you are saying that if this one is not defined, if this um, uh, constant is not defined, first define it and then write your uh, program. And it has end if. So when, when you call a header file that it includes this piece of code inside that, in the first time that you call it, you include it, it will check if it is defined, so it is not defined. It will define it and your code will be copied there. For the second time that you are including this, 
if you come here and it sees that this uh, constant has been defined, so it will not go inside this and it will not copy this piece of code in your program. So it will solve. So every header file will be added once in your um, uh, in your uh, where you are uh, including them. The other way is just write pragma once on top of your header file instead of this one. So inside this to um, this square that age, you just write pragma once instead of write, writing if uh, not defined define this and end if at the end, you will just write pragma once. It ensures the file is only included once within, within a single compilation. But pragma once is not an official part of the C++ language and not all compilers support, support it. But actually in recent uh, compilers, they usually support it. And as you can see, even Visual Studio will uh, add it automatically to your header files when you are creating them. So be careful about this one. Uh, it's really important not to, if you include something into your header file, don't include it into your CPP file because it's you will add, include your header file to your program, to your CPP file, and you don't need to write it in your uh, header file. And the other thing is that it's not good to include everything that you need during your implementation to your header file because you, you should add include them in your CPP file because when you are doing, if you add it to your include file, uh, to your header file, then whenever, for example, you want to do for your implementation in your own uh, class, in your CPP file, you want to use, for example, a method from regex library. Um, so you should add if you do not, if it is not related to the declaration of your class, it should not be included in your header file. It should only be included in your CPP file. If you put it in your header file, that header file probably will be included in other places. So in other places, even if you don't need that uh, regex library, um, that will be included as well. So it's not your program is growing very uh, easily just because um, you wanted to use it in your CPP file in one of your classes. So be careful if you only need a uh, header file in your uh, CPP file and it's not related to the declaration of your classes, you should not add it to your header file. You should only add it, include it to your CPP file. And in your header file, you should put pragma ones to be sure that it will not be included multiple times. You are not familiar with classes, but uh, I prefer to say these things in advance to you. And in the next lesson, we will discuss about uh, classes. I think we do not have time to uh, discuss about other things. Okay, maybe just this one, and we will discuss about the rest of the things in the next session. Uh, for boost, uh, for when you are implementing your program, you may need to work with different uh, libraries, and um, to add libraries to your program, and they usually ha they might be header only or they have headers and some uh, dynamic uh, links in some DLL files. So header only are the ones that they have all their program implemented in their header files. So then you only need to add um, those header files to your project. If not, uh, if uh, it has also some CPP files, they have they, pro they will not give you the CPP files. They will give you some build files, which we call them some DLL files, and also some .lib files. And you need to add those files, those headers, DLL files, and .lib files to your project to be able to use that library. Uh, you don't have to use Boost library here, but uh, at least for your first part of your project, but uh, for the second part, you probably need to use that. I'm just giving you one example. Uh, for Boost Library, you will go to this address. You will download the 
version that is used uh, that is defined for your PC based on the operating system that you have. And then you will go to the project properties of your um, program in Visual Studio. In this, you can see here in this location, you have all here include directories. You will define the path, you will set here the path to your um, uh, the path to your uh, boost libraries here, okay? And um, to add also the um, DLL part, the path to the dot .lib files, you will go to linker general and add the de dependencies that you have here with this address, okay? I will give you one uh, video file, I think it's 15 minutes. I gave it to the uh, students from the last year and uh, there um, uh, they are explain in more detail how to uh, add uh, how to download boost library how to add it to your project so you can um, see in more detail how what uh, how can you add a library to your project but you don't need it for your first part of the project Okay, I think uh, we are over. We don't have more time. Uh, in the next lessons, I will discuss about uh, classes and read and write from the files and also uh, probably a bit about regex uh, library. If you have any question, you can ask. Otherwise, we can stop the lesson. Um, I have a question. So the last slides about headers, are they new or uh, because I didn't see them in my slides? Uh, do you mean this one? Yes. No, you didn't have it, but when I was giving you an, uh, it, no, you, do not, you didn't have it in your slides, but when I was talking uh, uh, in Visual Studio, I was showing you how to add a header files in the class and how to add uh, a CPP file. And there, I when we add a header files in Visual Studio, we saw that there is a pragma ones, and I explained it um, a bit that what it is, but here I try to explain it in more depth. But you only, you don't need to work with this one, but for the second part of your project, when you are working with Qt library, when you create a header files, it will automatically will create something like this for you, and you should not change it. But you know, you should know what is Pragma once and what is this one, and use it uh, correctly. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is there any other question? No. Okay. So have a nice day and see you next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.